great, Dave Phillips. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. Hey, you're welcome, Brad. It's always good to be with you. You know that. So the I was telling uh, Greg, awe-inspiring to continue to see y'all's growth and your impact. Yeah, you know, it, it has been for us. I think uh, we kind of take it in stride because we don't look for it. It just seems to happen, and I think we surround ourselves with quality individuals that that have a passion like we do for what we do, and uh, that lends itself in our speakers like Lance Gill and Jason Glass and, and Mark Blackburn, who I know you know, and uh, they've done an amazing job to help us. And, you know, worldwide, it's, it's amazing what this has done and, and what it continues to do, and that's what's most exciting for us is seeing the education, seeing people take the education and then do something with it and take it to another level. Being a worldwide guy like mm -hmm. you are, I yep. mean, you're – your background is all over the place, it right? It is, yep. What, what was the reason for that? Was your dad a... My, dad, my, my dad was in the military. Um, I grew up... Which military? The British, British. British. Okay. Forces. And so what I, is your nationality? Are you... I, I'm American now, but yes. I, I was originally, yes. really, yeah, originally born in England. Okay. And uh, raised in Africa, in Kenya, and all in over Kenya. Africa. Okay. And then my parents immigrated to Australia, and when they did that, I came to America to college. Married an uh, American girl who's uh, been married to her for 30 years. Wow, great. And became an American citizen. So uh, I love it here. It's amazing. Yeah, because it, 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 it's, I think there's a part of, when I, when I look at y'all's brand, and I see the globalization of your brand, mm -hmm. but I'll, it, to me, I think you. Okay. I'm not saying that against Greg. Yeah. Okay. But I, the globalization and you, your, your stretch, you see things. And when I've worked with you on tour and we've worked with John or something like sure. that, there's this global perspective i think it's really cool well it is and and i think you know we often live kind of in our little bubble yeah and sometimes that can get frustrating or we get set in our ways i think my biggest benefit is that i see the world through a different lens and i see things through a different lens and that's because i've been exposed to so much i've lived in 27 different countries I've lived all over Africa, Asia, the Middle East. I've been in war zones. I've been in all kinds of things. I've seen pain and I've seen suffering and I've seen people ha succeed. So, you know, it gives me a little bit of a perspective on what people are going through every day. And, and you can relate that back to your business and how you do what you do. And, you know, that relates to, to caring and believing, right? And I believe in people. How did you get in the golf industry? I was a, a young player. When you grow up in a lot of uh, foreign countries, as an expatriate in those countries, most people will join the local golf club because regardless of whether you play golf or not, that's how you know what's going on in those countries. Mm -hmm. So we would always, wherever I was transplanted, first thing my dad would do was join the golf club. Okay. And then I, as a little kid, would just be there, and I morphed into a golfer and became a junior golfer. And and that's really how it got started and just, you know, played all over the world as a young kid. And there was no driving ranges. You just, you played golf. And uh, that got me good really quick. In fact, I didn't start till I was 12. By the time I was 13, I was a one handicap. No kidding. Yeah. So you just, I, I was a good athlete, played a lot of sports. Well, my dad was military and yeah. I learned to play golf in the Philippines. Yeah. Because what else are you going to do in the Philippines? Exactly. You either go bowling or you go to the golf course. <laughs> and you had your, like, that's where I learned to play baseball, but that's where I learned to play golf. Yeah. Now, because we moved around, I gave up golf and focused on baseball, and I didn't start playing golf again avidly until I went to college. It was our getaway. Yeah. But I get it. I mean, it was like, what else am I going to do? I'm in this foreign country. I don't know anybody. I'm not going to go out and move around the community. Yeah. You know, so. Well, and in a lot of cases, like in Africa, it was safe. Yeah, you know, that's so the, your parents were always like, well, we can't just let him go ride his bike, you know. So yeah. they would just drop you off at the golf club, and you were kind of safe. Yeah. People were looking out for you. They knew that, who you were, and you just go out and play. I mean, I remember in the summertime, I'd play 54, 72 holes. Really? There was no driving range. You just go play, and you, you just kept play. playing. And you do, had, you, do you think, for, as a golf professional and then as a, as a worldwide influencer in the field, um, our youth, and I always say our kids today would rather get it right than get it done. Yeah. You grew up from a world where you'd rather get it done than get it right. Exactly. How do we change that from your perspective? You know, the, it's scary because I don't know if whether we do, but, you know, there's this side of, you know, technology is here to stay. So you have to embrace it in a way that you can utilize it to accomplish that. And unfortunately, in many cases, it's not done that way. So people are glued to their mobile devices and people don't really learn anything. They just scan. So again, to Good me, point. it gets back to the education world of if education is cool, we adopt some technology, but we adopt some live learning experiences. 
you know, we, we could change and, and we could get back to, because it is a little bit scary, you know, I, but I, I do think we could get back to more of a active lifestyle. I mean, we talk about the healthcare crisis. It really should be, how do you teach people to take care of themselves better yeah. and they won't be sick? Yeah, right? wellness, con a wellness. wellness crisis. Exactly. I say the same thing mentally. Why is it that, and I've gotten a little bit of trouble saying this, but why is it that we can't go to the doctor? Yep. Like, come to me and say, I need my annual mental health screening. Yeah. Because exactly. we go to the doctor once a year to look for things that are coming down the road. Yeah. Yeah, we'll treat hypertension, but I'm going to start looking for indicators. Yeah. We can do the same thing in wellness with stress and anxiety and family discord and all that. Yes. You know, men have such a, an undiagnosed but high incidence of depression. Yeah. My juniors I see today are probably coming in with 50% anxiety. Yeah. I could diagnose it. I'm well, not doing that, but... Well, you know, I mean, a lot of this anxiety comes because of it's the FOMO, the fear of missing out, yeah. right? You, you, somebody tweets something, you're Gotta not there. Me. Oh, geez, I wish I was there. I feel bad because I'm not yeah. as good as that guy or cool as that girl. And that, that's a big problem. Yeah. And, and to me, the psychology side of this is more prevalent what you do today in life, sports, everything, than anything else. So as a coach, you know, where I'm looking at skill and training people how to be better at hitting a golf shot, it's only going to, I'm only going to get better if I have somebody like you on board that understands how to put that in perspective. Because those are the things to me that people miss. You know, it's like I did this talk with the National Teaching Summit with a, with a Navy SEAL, a mm -hmm. retired Navy SEAL. Yep. And how I got involved with him is how fast he learned. It's crazy, isn't right? it? Right? And, and the reason he learned so fast is because they do things. They actually do it, right? Yeah. And they're forced to do it. But the other thing is one of his biggest traits is he said, I meditate. Mm -hmm. I have mindfulness every day. I get my brain in a situation where it's quiet so it can learn rather than being bombarded by all the stuff that's around us. It's interesting. I have a buddy of mine who's SEAL Team 4, tried to play professional golf because um, he said, you don't ever tell somebody he can't yes. in my field. And I, I asked him the question. I said, you, we were talking one day, and I said, I don't know how to do it. He goes, Google. He goes, why is the American public so afraid to search out the answer? That's right. And SEALs, he said, we don't have time. No. And he told a story about being, out, being deployed, and, and he had a, a young, um, I think it was a young army man, um, who was driving the Humvee, and he asked, and the guy said, uh, sir, I've never been trained on how to drive up a, up and down a steep embankment with loose gravel. Yeah. And Chad goes, get out, because I'm going to figure this out. Yeah. He said, because, he said, I quickly realized I'd done something similar, but I had learned very quickly. He said, we have to learn on the fly. That's right. But we're so resistant. You, you're a technology file. You just love it. <laughs> I do love it. I do love it. I mean, you know, it's, it's funny you mentioned that phrase, uh, can or can't. You know, my grandfather used to say to me, the difference between can and can't is an apostrophe T. Don't let your life be ru ruled by an apostrophe T, hmm. right? I like that. Which it's is good. pretty interesting, That's right? That's pretty good, yeah. But, like, when you look at, like, the technology world and how everything's kind of coming together, um, even in our space where you look at fitness and wellness and people want to get better, like if you do a simple test on somebody, you say, okay, cross your arms, cross your chest, turn as far as you can, and they stop, right? If I just tell them, okay, from that position, now take a deep breath, let the air out, and turn again, they'll keep going, and they'll keep going, and their range of motion will improve. So I didn't give you an exercise. What happens is we get these mental blocks in our brain that that's only what we can do, mm -hmm. right? And if you convince your brain that, no, you can actually do this. It's okay. You're not going to hurt yourself. It's amazing how far we can go. And that's kind of what you learn from these SEALs is that how they get and do what they do is they get broken down and then they get built back up. That's how they're trained, right? Mm. But the belief system, I mean, Chris Sinog, who was the SEAL that I brought in, you know, Chris basically, his story was, you know, he, uh, his parachute didn't open when he jumped and his secondary chute opened and it only opened halfway and he hit the ground oh. and, and got severely injured. And this guy walks in the room like there's nothing wrong. He's 100% disabled. How does that happen? Yeah. I mean, you know, it makes that little elbow pain after hitting a few golf balls or that little wrist. We're like, what's going on? And that, that shows the me mental capacity of these guys to realize that this isn't going to affect me. I'm not going to let this rule my life. I'll right? find a way. I'll find a way, yeah. Do you think, from golf instructor standpoint, we were talking, Greg and I were talking about technology and 
there's this fear that technology is taking over and and but it's to me I think it's handicapping coaches because we're losing the human element yeah we are I mean you, you know and that might swing around I, I, I think it'll swing I think technology is an ebb and flow, right? Yeah. So, you know, what is real technology? This, is get, this gets back to this whole social media dilemma where you, you're pitched a product that doesn't even exist yet. Yeah. Kickstarter, Indigo, oh, I'm going to buy that. Then all of a sudden you've been waiting 12 months and it doesn't show up, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of people that it's really easy to create something graphically to show that I've got this piece of technology. But what's really here to stay? What, what do we use that's changing our lives that, that is here to stay? Because things are going to come in and go. So don't get into this. What I see coaches doing is jumping on this bandwagon as i got to have the latest, greatest thing. Even I was that guy, right? And now I'm starting to go, well, what's here every day? What hasn't changed? Not what's changing, but what hasn't changed? And are we refining that? So there's a video camera. You know, that's probably the one thing that is evident every day. It's on your phone now. Yeah. That's not going to really change. It's always going to be there. So, and that's useful. I can look at something, I can give somebody feedback based on emotion or movement. All this other stuff, I think there's a lot of people buying it. They really don't understand it. Some of it, I'm not sure is very accurate. Some of it's accurate. So how do you, how do you corral that and use it to help people really get better? Because the bottom line is, they just want to hit it over the creek on 12 or hit it a little bit further. Yeah. That's what the average golfer wants. Well, it's funny. I had the, uh, me and my golf guys yeah, and sure. talking to them and, and it was so funny, we were talking and they said, you know, so many people focus on the top 1%. Indeed. We went to the biggest, fattest group and just helped them get two shots better. That's so smart. Yep. And I'm like, that's brilliant, right? Because yeah. I do listen, when I, when I listen to coaches' talks, you know, the Teaching Coaching Summit, and, um, and I, 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 I only got there for one day before I spoke and I, was, I hit a couple talks. And a lot of people are mesmerized by the, the tour player, right? Yeah. And you and I are around them all the time. Yeah. They're special human beings. They are. Okay. When I go to the club, I see 300 golfers yeah, who, exactly. are, who are trying to get the ball in the hole. Yeah. Are, we, are we forgetting that? I, I think we are. I think we're forgetting. You guys do an amazing job of that, by the way. Well, I mean, you, you know, we, we're, I'm we're not fortunate. I'm not forgetting it. We're not forgetting it. Yeah. Giving people a plan to work with Bob and Joe and Mary. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, our, our system's pretty simple. Obviously, we, we're big into, hey, let's understand how you move first. And then I'll give you two options. I'll either change your body to move the way you want, or I'll just build a golf swing around the way you move. As long as I don't put you at risk of injury, easy. Yeah. Not hard at all. I think we lose sight. You know, like I look at beginning golfers all the time, and they come into TPI, and you know, most of them are trying to get the ball in the air or get better. And one of the big things we miss is most amateur golfers don't know the difference between setup and impact. Hmm. They don't know what it looks like, right? So if you look like a 15, 20 handicapper and you go, okay, show me your setup position, now show me impact, they'll look at you like a deer in the headlights because they think it's the same. But we know that if you freeze frame, two photographs, setup, impact, they're totally different. So if I could just show you how to get from setup to impact, setup to impact, setup to impact, and then start a small swing from here to impact, here to impact, all of a sudden you get the ball off the ground. And all of a sudden, you'd create compression, which is what great stri ball strikers like a John Rahm have, right? Yeah. So th those are the guys that I think that's where we miss, is we start talking about swing plane and swing path and all of this stuff. We know there's thousands of ways to swing the club, right? And you usually swing it based on how you can move. But there are certain things that are, when you look at, that I look at, impact. The best players in the world have a forward-leaning shaft and impact. They all look pretty similar when it comes down to impact. Space, they create space. Their hips don't invade the space where their arms are trying to go. They move out of the way so that they can have a clear path to the golf ball. And, you know, I have an acronym for space. If you want to have speed, power, accuracy, consistency, and efficiency, that's space. It's not that hard to do. If you focus on those two areas, anybody can do that. It's funny, you know, when you're sitting here talking and, you know, I go in to see Blackburn and, <clears throat> We're in the, I'm in the member guest, and I'm hitting it terrible, right? I'm a two handicap. I can move yeah. the ball. And I've always had a lot of speed, a lot of power, big guy, baseball guy, super strong grip, artificial left hip. Yep. So for a long time, my left foot was dropped back. So it's the only way I could move. I yeah, could, yeah, yeah. couldn't get the ball out of the hole. So I was almost at the point of having to put the suction at the end of my putter to get it out yeah. before I had my hip replaced. And I go in and see him, and he goes, look, he said, God love you. One of my dearest friends. I'm never going to change your posture or your grip. 
okay? But you have hand-eye coordination from here to here that's as good as anyone I've ever seen. Yeah. So how do I get you from here to here? Yeah. And it was such a refreshing commentary to listen to. Yeah. Because he was like, this is all I want you to focus on. It got rid of it. And that's body, that's personal coaching. It is. That, that's great coaching. That's right? great coaching. So, you know, when you watch the great coaches, they've been around enough, they've seen enough where they may say one thing and you'll yeah. be like, but it can't be that simple. Well, no, it can because yeah. I've already taken in consideration all that other stuff. And really what great coaching is is clearing the clutter. Yes. Right? Yes. So, you know, it's clearing the clutter, getting the stuff out of the way. And for me, more than anything, it's making the athlete find the answer. Don't give them the answer. Give them enough, just enough information so they figure it out on their own and they'll own it. Own it. And that's the problem with teaching the average player. We give them too much information. We don't give them time because one-on-one, -on -one, a lot of times somebody's paying you for an hour lesson. The, the, and this is the hard thing for a golf coach, is after every shot, most people are looking at you to say something. Yep. Right? One of my biggest traits is I'll, I'll start a lesson and I'll walk away. I'll be, I'll be right back. I've got to get a drink of water. Well, in my building, I walk inside and I've got a window that's smoke. They can't see, but I can see them. And I watch them through the window while I'm sipping my water because yeah. I want to see whether they've actually grasped what I've told them to do. Are they figuring it out? Are they somebody that figures it out? Or are they just getting frustrated? Right? And then I come back out and I give him some more information. You know, I walked by the Orange Whip booth yesterday and I stopped the guy and I said, hey, I want to thank you for fixing my chipping yips. He was like, what are you talking about? And I said, Josh Teeter, one of my tour players, comes in town and he's got this Orange Whip wedge. Now I've got a super strong grip, so it's not good for pitching and chipping around the green, right? Yeah. And I, you know, Mark had worked with me for a while and, and so he gave me this Orange Whip thing. He said, try it. And of course, I couldn't do it because I would, yeah. you know, it was terrible. But I sat there and I said, I'm going to figure this thing out. And I was like, if I put the ball a little further back, I slide my hands down the club, I neutralize my grip, I almost touch the steel. Mm -hmm. I feel like this. All of a sudden, my chipping, and when I went somewhere and I was playing with somebody, and the guy was like, you may be the best wedge player I've ever seen for a guy who doesn't play professionally. Yeah. And I'm like, it's that orange whip, because it was like figuring it out. There you go. It was, I know what all the logic says, and I'm using it, mm -hmm. but I'm finding my way. That's right. And I think that's what coaches forget, is we all have our own psychological fingerprint. We got to, yeah. coaches got to figure out what that is. Yeah. Uh, you, you, need, you need to create those feedback loops, right? Yeah. You need to give them enough feedback so that they know they're on the right track and you need to know when to say something and when not. And, you know, that, that gets even more refined when you get in an elite situation, when you're on the range at a tour event where they're playing for a million dollars. I go, because the best coaches can say one little tiny thing at the right time that can take an athlete into another level, Right. And sometimes, because there's so much going on and their mind is all over the place, that's the way you bring back that focus and get them to, to, to simplify. I love it. Right? Thank you. I, I told Greg this, and I mean this sincerely. Thanks for all that y'all have done for me. Y'all hey. gave me a start in a platform that was brilliant. And uh, thank you. Hey, thank you're you. very welcome. And man. I love working with you, with John. I love working and, with you, too. And it's going to be a fun year. It will be, man. Thanks man. so Thanks. much. You got Good it. to be with you. Awesome.